Chapter Seventeen of Claude Lightfoot or How the Problem Was Solved by Father Francis Finn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen, in which is given an account of a novel fishing expedition. That evening, Frank called Charlie Pearson and Dan Dockery into the tent, and he noticed with suppressed amusement how carefully the two guarded against meeting each other's eyes. Charlie. Did you ever say that Dan sang like a little girl screaming when she sees a rat? No, sir, exclaimed Charlie indignantly. And Dan, did you say that Charlie, when he sang, looked like a man dying of colic? I never said anything like it. I could listen to Charlie singing all day. And I, put in Charlie, like Dan singing best of all the singing I've heard yet. <laughs> now don't you two feel foolish here you've been dodging each other and sulking just because somebody's been lying well i declare exclaimed charlie i ought to know willie hardy by this time me too said dan then their eyes met and with one impulse they grasped hands i'm a mule charlie said dan i'm another only worse said charlie you're both a pair of ninnies added the candid frank it is worth your while learning now that people will talk and carry tales but no matter what you hear no matter if what they say seem true or not don't allow tale-bearing to break up a long friendship life is very short and friends are not as plentiful as blackberries stick to your friends through good and evil report then frank departed whereupon dan and charlie emptied master hardy's bottle of cologne and filled it with coal oil they then slipped a few burrs between his sheets and having tied his prettiest shirt into a number of knots they departed arm in arm at peace with themselves and all the world willie in the meantime was elaborately protesting to elmwood that it was all a joke for all that he did not seem prepared for reprisals when he went into the tent a few minutes later and poured a few drops out of his cologne bottle upon his pink ears he uttered an exclamation his perennial smile vanished and he dashed out into the open air dan and charlie were awaiting his appearance with impatience but they looked very composed and indifferent as he approached who wath using my cologne he asked for answer dan put his handkerchief to his nose phew he said and ran away was it you continued willie fixing an angry eye on charlie phew cried charlie following his companion and these two friends once they were out of sight and hearing laughed till the tears rolled down their cheeks the tears came to hardy's eyes for other reasons as he went off in search of frank frank he cried dan and charlie have stolen two bottles of my cologne it was a joke said frank taking no account of the extra bottle which willie had thrown in frank on further investigation discovered that willie had told harry archer some remarkable things about the way in which that estimable young gentleman was spoken of at the camp archer after an interview with frank came over and shook hands all around when he reached willie he took a firm grip of that youngster's hand and squeezed it till willie danced stop harry stop it was a joke so what this mimicked harry squeezing much motion into his jocose little friend as a result of all this willie found himself an unwelcome companion to all except claude who regarded him as an amusing curiosity to cement the new ties frank proposed a great fishing expedition for thursday afternoon we'll hire two boats from the hotel he said and i'll get fifty or sixty minnows john winter can take charge of one boat and i'll take the other we'll get rob collins and his brother to come along and we'll have a rousing time is hardy to come along asked charlie pearson of course he's to supply us with fishing stories 
it was a mirthful party that set forth on the following afternoon from mr collins's boathouse as the boats moved out from the little bay and turned in a southwesterly direction toward buck island charlie and dan who were seated beside each other and who by way of compensation for their falling out had practised singing together for several hours of the preceding night softly at first but louder and clearer as they saw that the crew of the other boat were straining their ears sang a duet called whispering hope it is a beautiful tender song one of those penetrating melodies that reaches the heart presently frank made a sign the rowers rested on their oars and midway between buck and vesper islands the two friends hand in hand trilled forth the beautiful strains in an elevation born of the hour the place and their newly cemented friendship vocal music gains a new charm upon the water and when such notes golden and liquid are wafted over the ripples as came from the throats of charlie and dan one the leading soprano and the other the solo alto voice of milwaukee college the effect is indescribably beautiful at the end of the duet the two singers were startled by hearing the clapping of many hands from the direction of vesper island and turning they saw a group of young seminarians standing on the eminence in front of their summer villa and forming an appreciative though unlooked-for audience give em another song said frank we are not ready answered charlie oh that's a fact he added quickly let walter come into our boat and we'll sing a trio the change was effected in a trice and presently they carolled the gay notes of shakespeare's under the greenwood tree who loves to lie with me and tune his merry note unto the sweet bird's throat come hither come hither come hither here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather but winter and rough weather during the lively movement of this pastoral claude jumped to his feet and would have danced had not rob collins reached over and catching the lively lad's head in the landing net brought him tumbling into willie's arms i'll thing too frank volunteered willie what can you sing sure he belonged to our choir at the college explained dockery but he was put out for cutting up in the chapel i didn't cut up i would thing my prayer out loud and the choir director thought i was talking that's a whopper said walter well go on and sing said frank briskly with folded hands and eyes modestly veiled willie opened his pretty mouth and in a voice marvellously sweet and accurate sang sweet spirit hear my prayer good gracious whispered winter he sings like an angel yes answered rob collins and what's more he looks like an angel one would think butter wouldn't melt in his mouth commented elmwood and added he's the greatest fraud on the face of the earth if he were the one millionth part as good as he looks or sounds he'd be the best fellow in the crowd all of which goes to prove that fine feathers do not make fine birds much as they despised him the boys broke into applause at the conclusion of willie's song while the sweet singer looked ineffably pretty and demure then they resumed their oars and pulling with an equal stroke shortly cast anchor near a point of land on the further shore south of buck island some of the minnows are pretty small frank remarked as he put his two hands into the minnow bucket and scooped out three tiny shiners that's all right said rob collins the small minnows for the small boys aren't you smart exclaimed his brother it doesn't take size to make a fisherman when it comes to fishing i can give you points then each of the small boys had a word to say frank quelled the rising storm by putting the smallest minnow on his own hook and giving the larger ones to claude and dan what we want is fish said frank of course if all use big minnows we'll very likely catch nothing or only a few large fish but if frank finished by pulling in a fat perch give me a little minnie too cried claude 
me too echoed dan use what you've got said frank adjusting his minnow and throwing it out again all who baited with small minnows were kept quite busy pulling in the nibbling perch while claude and dan and walter collins sat quietly watching their hand lines which they had cast some forty feet towards the point i'm getting tired of this fishing said claude jumping to his feet and giving the boat a lurch which nearly threw him into the water down in the boat said frank sharply claude obeyed and it was lucky he had been so prompt for there was a jerk at his line and he grasped it just in time to save its being carried away Whoo! he bawled there's no perch about this he's pulling like a billy goat get the landing net quick hand over hand he brought his line in and his eyes lighted up as he noticed a great commotion in the waters did you see its tail he shouted don't talk to me about your small minnows it's a black bass pshaw growled elmwood as he brought the net under the fish it's only a dogfish they're no good but they're big said claude give me another big minnie claude was now well content walter who had resumed his place in the other boat now brought in a three-pound pickerel and so excited were all over the catch that they failed to notice the coming of a boat which was manned by four lads the oldest of whom could not be more than seventeen and which anchored fifty yards north of them Shh, whispered frank as the din grew louder we can't expect to catch fish in all this noise Shh, shh, passed from lip to lip and making fresh casts all lapsed into solemn silence smiling willie was the first to notice the presence of the new fishing party i wonder who those fellows are he inquired in tones that could be heard from their fishing grounds at least as far as buck island well that's cheeky came in tones no less clear from the older boy in the boat a bright handsome lad with a fine presence and a clear eye i guess they're from chicago observed rob collins wickedly but i'm not sure for i can't see their feet if those fellows observed another of the strangers didn't have their hats on we could tell by the presence or absence of hayseed in their hair whether they come from milwaukee or from some civilized part of the world rob collins elmwood and winter were obliged to turn their heads to conceal their laughter the boyish retort was good i wonder whether those fellows intend fishing with hooks or do they expect the fish to jump into their boat this was dockery's contribution to the conversation those fellows observed the third strange boy don't seem to be catching anything there is a young man in their boat with spectacles now if we were to throw an idea out he might catch that at least i'm afraid said frank that if the young persons in that boat throw out any ideas their boat won't be very much lighter and besides added collins they'll go into intellectual bankruptcy the strangers broke into a laugh evidently they were a good-natured set rob whispered frank they have given me an idea get me that pickerel of walter's quietly so that those fellows won't notice pass round the word for our crowd not to give my joke away and we'll have some fun then the roguish frank slyly fitted the pickerel on his own hook and allowed him to swim away hey fellows he then shouted get the landing net i've got a splendid fish while the strangers looked on in unconcealed interest frank landed his fish amidst great artificial enthusiasm it's the size of the one claude caught said dockery aloud that is the fifth pickerel we've caught in five minutes shouted the voracious willie if you spoil our little joke by any more of your injudicious lying snapped rob we'll put you out on a hook till you're soaked the less you say the better we'll get along 
It was a joke, simpered Willie. Joke, snarled Rob. You couldn't tell a joke from a jumping jack to save your worthless little soul. In speaking to Willie, the boys, as the reader may have noticed, were unsparing in their words. But his lying had brought them into contempt, not wholly undeserved. And besides, his feelings were not easily hurt. Now, Rob, you take a turn in hauling him in. We can let Winter catch him next, and by that time our fish will be played out. Gracious! exclaimed the eldest of the outsiders when rob had landed the pickerel those fellows are catching big fish right along yes added one of his companions and they're all of the same size too whereupon our party had great difficulty in restraining themselves from a burst of laughter which would have put their neighbors upon the scent while winter was making the fourth catch of this most serviceable pickerel rob collins to his great joy discovered a big fish straining at his line two landing nets were brought into requisition and while john recovered the poor pickerel rob landed a lusty four-pound black bass oh this is glorious whispered frank now we'll go to work and catch that black bass three times more those chicago folks will respect us before we're through i say said one of the strangers what do you people bait your hooks with shoe buckles roared dockery frank gave dockery a stern look the question was a civil one and frank was pained at dockery's rudeness we're using shiners frank answered affably so are we in this boat but we've only had one bite so far and the fish got away the conversation was now interrupted by Claude's crying, Hi! Hi! I've got a monster! Then, with the same energetic ceremonies, they landed the black bass for the third time. The reason we're succeeding so well, said Frank courteously, is because we've discovered a new way of fishing. It's a secret yet, but if you fellows would like to know it, call over at our camp at the further end of linnet pond to-morrow and we'll tell you besides giving you a share of the fish thank you returned the spokesman i'll bet this fish is as large as any we've caught yet cried pearson pulling in his line hurry up with that landing net before he gets away why it's the same size exclaimed one of the strangers a while ago you fellows were hauling in pickerel and now it's nothing but black bass black bass move in shoals maybe explained frank how many did you catch we caught one pickerel just before you came answered frank evasively and you've seen what we've been doing since that makes four pickerel and four black bass said the stranger but how about the five pickerel you caught in fifteen minutes? Ah, uh, the fellow that said that is, is injudicious, answered Frank. At which very moment the injudicious fellow began pulling in and brought to the gunwale of the boat a fine wall-eyed pike over five pounds in weight. Now, whispered Dockery, we can work this pike on them. I guess not answered frank they might begin to see where the hole in the millstone is when i was here last year asserted willie in ringing tones i caught a pike like this with a five cent fishing line and he weighed thirty-five pounds and a half that's the stupidest lie you've told since you could talk growled pearson willie saw that no one believed him he was very heavy anyhow and he knocked me down with one flap of his tail boys said frank let's make for home or this boat will be struck by lightning End of chapter seventeen